Well, hello and good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you're well. Uh, it's great to be able to meet together on this Sunday morning. Weather report this morning down here in Bournemouth area is that it's actually looking a bit grey. Um, uh, it was bright, a bit brighter than it was about an hour ago, though, so not doing too, too bad. Uh, seeing as though it was grey, though, I thought I would start this morning by lightening the mood a little bit with a few jokes. Would you like to hear a few jokes? Um, I've got no idea what you've said, so I'm going to say them anyway. Uh, a classic to start with. Uh, what did the orange say when it got to the top of the hill? Uh, I'm sorry, sir, I can go no further. I ran out of juice. A little while back I saw a man spill all of his Scrabble tiles along the road, so I asked him, hey man, what's the word on the street? And then finally, how did the baker get an electric shock? Well, he stood on a bun and a current ran up his leg. In fact, that last one was my favourite joke as a child, so I hope that at least made you smile, or at least one of those, but if it didn't, then I'm very sorry. Uh, but anyway, getting to what we're here for this morning, it's good to be able to gather together to praise God, to celebrate him, to hear from his word and to pray together. In fact, today is a particular day of prayer because it is the Baptist Mission Society Day of Prayer. They run this each year. And so uh, a little later on, uh, Barbara is going to lead us in prayer uh, for the Baptist Mission Society and everything they do across the world. So we uh, look forward to sharing in that a little later on. And just one other notice to let you know about, uh, and that is, of course, that next week uh, we start the Bible course on Zoom. Uh, it's great that uh, seven or eight or so have signed up to take part in that course. If you'd still like to join us, there's time. Just let us know if you'd like to uh, come along. Uh, all the details were on the newsletter this last week and will be again this coming week, or, or we can send them to you, to you if you don't get the newsletter. But please, if you'd like to come along, great Bible overview. Uh, we'd love to see you there uh, and for a discussion on Zoom. So uh, please do uh, sign up if you'd like to. But I think I should read the Bible for us. I mean, this is more what we're here for this morning, isn't it? And I thought I'd start this morning with this theme of us praying for the wider world, thinking about the BMS and the work they do around the world. And indeed, our theme this morning is prayer anyway. Uh, how in Acts we see the, the people of God being a prayer-focused community. Uh, let's read Psalm 100. And it says these words. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. We need to know that this morning, don't we? It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. That's a wonderful reassurance, isn't it? That with everything going in our world, so much going on around us, and I'm sure so much going on in our own lives as well, we can know that we are the Lord's that fundamentally he holds us in his hands. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture, and he watches over us each and every day. And that's the reason we can praise him this morning. Give thanks to him for his glory and for his power at work, not just in this world, but in our lives too. So let's pray and give thanks as we start. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you for the ability to gather this morning. We thank you for the technology that permits this method of meeting, Lord, in a changed way, Lord, but we still manage to have songs and praise your name through music. We can pray together and lift your name high. We can hear from your words and learn about what it says for our lives. And so, Lord, as we gather this morning, we do so lifting your name. May we be a people of praise, for you are good, your love endures forever, your faithfulness continues through all generations, and that is our hope, and that is, our, is your sure promise towards each of us. We thank you, Lord, for all you do. In your name. Amen. Well, shall we have a song this morning? Uh, we're going to start with a song that focuses our minds where they should be focused. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let's sing this now.
Wonderful. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Well, we're almost at our time of prayer, and as I said earlier, today marks the day of the BMS Global Day of Prayer. Uh, it's an opportunity for churches who support the BMS uh, around the globe uh, to come together to pray for the work that they do, uh, to remind ourselves too of the work that they do right the way across the globe, in order that we can lift our request to, Lord, to the Lord and to uh, pray for their work uh, in a service together. Um, now, if you don't know much about the BMS, they, they've been running for oh, uh, well over a century now. They were formed in the 19th century as a way in which uh, we could reach the world with the gospel. In fact, if you go on their website, they say that their mission is to share life in all its fullness with the world's peoples by enabling to, them to know Christ, alleviating suffering and injustice, improving the quality of life with people as their primary agents of change, motivating, training, sending and resourcing them. And of course we here as a church, we're involved in that work, our, our mission partners through the BMS are Tom and Melanie Spears that, who work over in Chad at the Guinebor 2 Hospital, they work in the realm of healthcare. But they've got missionaries working in over 30 countries across four continents, so people all over the world sharing the name of Jesus and showing the love of God in his name. And so this is a great opportunity for us, for churches to pull together, to bring our requests for this work to God on this particular day. And it's every uh, year that they hold a, a day of prayer for the BMS. Uh, wonderfully, Barbara, our, our uh, BMS uh, representative, our contact here at the church, is going to lead us in prayer this morning. And the way in which the prayer is going to work is that um, the BMS actually produced a PowerPoint that churches could use uh, to facilitate prayers. And so Barbara's going to pray for us, and you'll see the PowerPoint slides uh, come on the screen. We've made them full screen just so that you can read some of the words on it. The idea being that as Barbara prays, she can lead us in prayer this morning and we can bring our requests to God. But if you wanted to go back at a later date and revisit each slide and just pray on this day for the BMS in your own time as well, you can do so and just hit pause on each slide on the video uh, and watch that back and then pray for the particular element of uh, uh, the prayer uh, in your own time as well. So feel free to do that if you would like to. But let's bring our request to God. Let's pray for the BMS and the work they do across the globe. And I'll hand over to Barbara, who will lead us via uh, the video. Let us come to God in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we come to you at the beginning of another week thanking you for the many blessings you give to us each day. We thank you that you are always with us, no matter what is happening in our lives. We can turn to you and know that your love is so great, you will give us peace and comfort and help us to live as you want us to. On this special day of prayer for the Baptist Missionary Society, we bring before you the millions around the world who still live in poverty. We pray for those who struggle to find enough to eat, have no home, clean water, health care or schooling for their children. We pray for those working with BMS, changing lives, giving people hope and daily sharing the love of Jesus. Our loving Father, we pray for the needs of our world as we all struggle with the spread of the coronavirus. Help us as we try to follow the advice given to keep each other safe. We thank you for those who use their skills working to provide the vaccines and also those who are delivering them. May governments be willing to share them with countries who don't enjoy the medical facilities we take for granted. Guide those making the decisions and help us all to trust in you day by day. We thank you, Lord, for the many who have come to hear about Jesus through the vision BMS had of transforming one million lives over the past five years. We pray for the BMS World Mission new strategy and vision, that those implementing it may be given wisdom and guidance to challenge us all as we seek together to spread the gospel around the globe. May your Holy Spirit guide and lead all who are involved. 
We pray for those who are in senior management, working at BMS headquarters at Didcot. Guide them as they make important decisions so personnel will go and serve where you want them to. And the young people in the action teams will inspire others to serve you where you lead. We thank you for the opportunities BMS has to work and support partners, churches and organisations in other countries. Help them as they advise, share their skills, teach and train others so people can become independent and self-sustaining and enable churches to grow and witness in their communities. We ask your blessing on those BMS workers serving in places where very few people know about Jesus. Protect them, we pray, when it is hard to speak openly. Give them opportunities to witness by their actions. May they be aware of your presence with them and the prayers of others, like ourselves, giving them strength and courage as they work for you. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunities we have to support and pray for those who work with BMS. Give churches and individuals the vision that BMS has of telling others about the saving love of Jesus and how knowing him changes lives. We thank you for those who produce the Engage magazine, the prayer guide, videos, special appeals, birthday scheme and collecting boxes, all helping us to pray and support financially BMS as we journey forward together to bring the knowledge of Jesus to our needy world. We thank you, Lord, for enabling us to pray with many around the world today, for the technology that brings us together while physically apart. We bring these prayers in the name of Jesus, our Saviour and Lord. Amen. Yes, amen. Thank you, Barbara, for leading us in prayer. And if you do want more information about the BMS, then of course you can go to their website and find out a bit more about the work they do. Or indeed, you can get in touch with us and we'll, we'll point you in the right direction as well. And there are various resources available there to keep in touch or to uh, use for prayer. Uh, and uh, in fact, we're going to be using it, we're going to be um, uh, focusing on BMS as part of our prayer time tomorrow morning for those who join us for our Monday morning prayer time. So please do join us then. Uh, if you'd like to, and we'll, we'll include the BMS prayers in our prayer time as well. And of course, this morning, uh, it just so happened, I mean, it was if, as, as if it were planned almost. Uh, in fact, it was just that it coincided, there's something of God's hand in it perhaps as well, um, that we are thinking about prayer this morning. And it got me thinking uh, about uh, the methods of communication that we have, and in particular, phones. We're so used to phones these days, aren't we, as methods of communication. But I was looking back a little bit at the history of the phone. And in fact, if I bring the PowerPoint back on screen, the first phone that they say was, uh, well, phone, I, phone is probably a grandiose title for it, but you'll get what I mean in a minute. The first method of communication using a handheld device, let's call it that, uh, was way, way back in 1672 when the first of these, well, we, we children use these these days, don't they? Uh, they use the, the, the two cups connected with a piece of uh, string or something like that to communicate. And you hold the cup to your ear, don't you, as the other person speaks. I'm not sure the one on the screen would work very well, in fact, because the, the, the string has to be tight between the two, doesn't it, in order for it to work. But anyway, 1672 was the first method of communication, they reckon, uh, of a kind that was anything like uh, the phone. Moving on a little bit further, uh, we had oh, a few few things on the screen there. Uh, you might be able to identify what uh, uh, particularly the, the top two there are, but the one at the bottom there, Morse code. Samuel Morse found that he could transmit messages by pressing down and releasing buttons on the mechanical device there that you can see on the screen. And so the Morse code device was uh, brought into existence. That was way back in 1838 that happened, so a bit, a bit closer, but still a long way off to where we are today. 
Then, of course,、uh, on the left-hand side there on your screen, Alexander Graham Bell with the first phone that we could see that is anything like our modern-day、uh, phones. 1876. You notice there's no dial dial on it or, or buttons to press. You had to speak and say everything through the speaker and hold the、uh, the headset to your ear as well in order to uh, uh, hear what was going on. But 1876. That first phone call, and of course, going into the the twentieth century, there perhaps a, a slightly more modern version with a, a dialer on it. I mean, I don't know if a, a young children today would know what a dialer is particularly. There is all mobile phones, isn't it now? But、um, uh, but a dialer there that you may have used where you span it round and it would move itself back mechanically to the right place. You'd spin it round with the next number and so on and so forth to bring the the, the number in and to dial the right number. Uh, 20th century that was, right the way through to the button press phone. 1980s. That's a very 1980s looking phone, isn't it? Definitely 1980s there. The button press phone, and of course it was around the 1980s that the mobile phone first uh, really uh, came into being. Uh, the first major phone that was produced anyway was the Motorola Dynatac. Dyna- Dynatac, there we go. Not Dynatech, Dynatac, otherwise known as the brick phone, the big one that you had to hold like this. I think beforehand you had to almost carry a suitcase with a little receiver on it, which had all the the, the tech, technology in it, and you held the receiver up. But the Dynatac phone was the first one that you could hold to your ear and、uh, had an hour's talk time, eight hours standby time, and that was your lot. That was it. That was all you got out of that one. 1992, the first text message sent. Before 1993, the first smartphones were sold to the to the public. And actually, I was looking through my uh, uh, some some of my uh, uh, phones that I used to use. Unfortunately, I don't have any of my early phones still, but I picked up a few that I had、uh, along the way. Here's one that I had about 12 years ago. It's like a, a smaller version of that old brick phone that you sometimes see. Uh, uh, let's say about 12, 10, 12 years ago, I probably had this.、Um, there were bigger versions of this back in the day. This was when phones. What a phone did was it made phone calls. It sent a text message, and you could probably set, you could set an alarm, or or even you might find Snake on it, the game Snake. For those of you who remember that. That kind of thing. That was a phone that I had back in the day, looking quite battered now. I don't think I used this one, but I was given this one along the way back in the sort of late two two thousands, two thousand five to two thousand and ten ish. You saw a lot of these in films actually, and you saw them in films because they looked quite cool because you flipped up the top of them. Oops, you can't see that behind the PowerPoint. There you go. It's a flip flip top phone like that where you slid it up and then dialed your number there, and you could do that. And you see all the actors using those in the films. Uh, early smartphone that I that I had about oh I don't know eight to ten years ago maybe、uh, a smaller one they got a lot larger now right the way through to the kind of larger smartphones that you get these days it's funny isn't it that they went from being really large phones to begin with like the the, the brick phone they got really small. And now they're starting to get bigger again. They've sort of levelled out around this kind of size. It's amazing, isn't it, what technology can do these days? And of course, without technology, we wouldn't be able to do this service at all. Now we use、uh, the internet and mobile networks in order to make this all possible these days. But of course, when we think about prayer and methods of communication with God, when we think about prayer with God,、uh, we are thinking about something which is available all the time in every place. Wherever we are, and at whatever time,、uh, when I was uh, uh, back up in、uh, living in Alderholt, you would tend to find that even with modern mobile phones, there were some places. In fact, even the church itself, which is a bit of a signal well, you couldn't get signal all of the time. Sometimes it would work, sometimes it w- it wouldn't work, and you never knew quite whether it was going to be reliable. Had to pick your network very very carefully.、Uh, But with prayer itself, when we think about communicating with God, we have this incredible privilege that we can talk with God wherever we are, whatever we're doing, and with whatever circumstance we're facing at the time. And it is something of a conversation prayer, isn't it? You know, we when we read God's word, we discover what God would say to us, don't we? We read it, we find out about Him, about how He wants us to live our lives, about Jesus and His sacrifice for us. Some amazing things that God did for us, and stories which bring、uh, Him to life for us as we read them, and His encounters with people many, many years ago. Incredible things that He did among us. God speaks to us through that means, and prayer is is almost like our way of responding to that. That we can pray and bring our requests to God. We can thank Him for all He's do- all He's done, and prayer is available at any time, no matter what we're going through.、Uh, here's a Bible verse from Philippians chapter. 
Four, don't worry about anything, it says. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. We've done a bit of that this morning, haven't we, with the BMS prayers, thanking God for all he does across our world, but also bringing him our requests, the things that are on our hearts and on our minds. And the wonderful thing is we can do this at any time. God says, don't worry about anything. Lay it all at my feet. I'm with you, no matter whether you feel that uh, you're alone right now in this circumstance, whether you're feeling like you're apart from other people, God is always with us. He's always just a, a phone call away in the sense that we can pray wherever we are and for whatever he's laying upon our heart. And so I'd encourage you this morning as we think about prayer together and being a prayer focused community, remember that wherever we are, whatever we're going through, God is only a prayer away. We can communicate him with him through the wonder of prayer. Well, let's read our passage for this morning then. And our passage this morning, as we think about the book of Acts, is from Acts chapter 4, 23 to 31. And this is where we read about what the believers did after what happened to Peter and John and the Sanhedrin that uh, Brian led us through last week. They told them not to share the name of Jesus, not to teach in his name. And this is what happens when they are released. So if you've got a Bible, you can read it through with us, Acts chapter 4, 23 to 31. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. It tells us much about the power of prayer. And we'll think on those words in just a few moments time, but let's have a song again first of all. And we're going to sing that reminds us of the indescribable nature of God, the wonder of his power. Let's sing indescribable together now. To the depths of the sea Creations revealing your majesty From the colors of fall To the fragrance of spring Every creature unique in the song that it sings Indescribable, uncontainable You place the stars in the sky And you know them by name You are amazing, God All powerful, untamable All struck we fall to our knees As we humbly proclaim You are amazing, God Nimble where it should go Or seen heavenly storehouses laden with snow Who imagine the sun and give source to its light Yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night 
Okay, well, let's think a bit more about prayer this morning and the power of prayer in the life of the early church. Well, prayer is it is one of those fundamentals, isn't it, in the Christian life?、Uh, I like to quote that I came across from the the great reformer Martin Luther. Don't get don't get him confused with Martin Luther King. This is Martin Luther of the 16th century Europe, and he said this: "To be a Christian without prayer." Is no more possible than to be alive without breathing.、Uh, fundamentals of the Christian life, isn't it? To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. So he felt the most important part, one of the most important parts of being a Christian, was prayer. And yet, of course, many Christians we we struggle with prayer to a degree, don't we? We, we live in such a busy world with so many distractions, so much、uh, that demands upon our time that. Prayer can quickly become left behind. Maybe not deliberately,、um, but it often just doesn't quite make it to the forefront of our priorities in the way that it should. Now, perhaps partly that is our fault. We don't prioritise it as much as we should.、Uh, but we saw back in Acts one that after Jesus left, the first thing that the apostles did is that they joined together in prayer and asked the question: Is prayer your first priority or last? Resort. It's a key question for us, for us to ask as Christians.、Uh, Corrie Ten Boom put it in a, a very a simple and similar way. She said, "Is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire?" Great question to ask, isn't it? We show our priorities by what we put first and what we give our time to. And I know that it can be so easy to not give a priority to prayer. So simple, isn't it, to skip over it in our in our day to day walk to get on with something else that seems to be more pressing, and yet prayer is so fundamental to our lives, so important to our walk as Christians. And partly, I think the reason for it is that perhaps it isn't so much of a priority because we misunderstand something about the nature of prayer itself, which is really what this message is all about.、Uh, we rejoin the the apostles Peter and John in Acts four as they return from having been brought before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish authorities, and they were told not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. I mean, really, it's a pretty weak verdict that they give the apostles.、Uh, given that the Jewish leaders, they recognise that there was the healing of this lame man in Acts three, that it was a notable sign, which even they couldn't deny was special. Everyone in Jerusalem knew it, and so really, it was it was one nil to Jesus at this point in the book of Acts. But from verse twenty three, we learn what happened next. What did the apostles and believers do in response, and what did God do among them? As they did, as they responded, well, just like Acts one, in response to a challenging situation, they turned to prayer, and of course, to praying together. Verse twenty three. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. They knew what they should do. 
I mean, there is something, isn't there, to start with? There's something about prayer with other people that does make a difference. It's why we continue to hold our Monday morning prayer meetings online, even whilst unable to meet physically, because we recognise the purpose and the power that there is in being able to pray together. And I'd encourage us, uh, again, you know, please do join us, 10.30 on a Monday morning on Zoom. Uh, The details are all on the newsletter, or we can get them uh, to you. Um, You know, I find prayer together, in even in a way where we're apart at the moment online, it not only builds unity and understanding between people, but it frequently helps us to focus on prayer as well. It helps focus our minds and our hearts uh, when we do it in a, in a together kind of way. And even if Monday doesn't work for you, of course, there's always the option to pray with others over the over the phone or online. Technology is, is wonderful um, in that it opens up all sorts of avenues um, that we can do so, even at the moment. And of course, the believers in Acts 4 certainly saw the power of this as they raised their voices together in prayer, seeing God do amazing things among them. So let's look at the nature of prayer and what we learned this morning. And number one is this, we see that they were praising God in prayer. Here's the thing about prayer. Prayer only works when we know first who we're praying to and why that matters. You know, there's no other religion that sees prayer the way that Christianity does. Uh, Muslims pray, but it's usually set prayers five times a day. Uh, Hindus pray, but usually they're the form of of chants and uh, recitation of liturgical or very repetitive prayers. Uh, Jews pray, but even then it's it's with a view of God being far less approachable and, and knowable in a personal sense. Only Christianity sees prayer as a personal, relational, intimate and involved process communing with the living God of the universe. Uh, I like what Charles Spurgeon said uh, about prayer. He said, true prayer is neither a mere mental exercise nor a vocal performance. It is far deeper than that. It is a spiritual transaction with the creator of heaven and earth. And that's where the believers begin, in fact, isn't it? By praising God as the God of all creation. They begin by lifting his name high to get the focus off of themselves and onto the God who holds the universe in his hands. Verse 24, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. I remember when I was at a Bible college, a friend of mine in our tutor group, we were doing a, me- a mission week uh, with a school group over in the Purbex. And one evening we all went up onto the cliffs to watch the sunset together. And as we sat there, uh, my friend who was, um, uh, he was quite a sort of bloke's bloke. He, he liked rock music. He wore t-shirts with slogans on. He had sort of studded leather wrist bracelets and that sort of thing. I remember us sitting there and he just said, do you know, I think I feel closest to God when I see a view like that. The the cliff tops in front of us, the sun setting, uh, the waves breaking quietly on the sea below. I think many of us relate to that, don't we, when we look at beautiful pictures of creation or see a landscape in front of us. And there is something really true about that. Why? Why? Because the sovereign Lord we pray to is the one who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. They reflect something of his nature and his glory. And what the believers were acknowledging as they began their prayers, the first thing they acknowledged was God's sovereign, and the word sovereign just means supreme, his supreme authority and power over everything he has made, everything we see around us and our lives as well. You know, you can go out and look at the stars at night, for example, and thank God that he is the one who put them in place. You can do that even at the moment. You can see a beautiful view, sense the closeness of God and his creativity and creative glory. We can look at our own lives and and give thanks for the many ways that we see God at work in us, even in his ability to get us through the darkest of times in life. Why? Well, because God is sovereign over all creation and his supreme sovereignty, he watches over you and me and our world. We learn that he is the Lord of all creation. What else do we learn about God? Well, second, we learn that he is the God who has revealed himself himself to us. 
Creation may be wonderful, and it is, and we can sense God's presence and power through it, but tangibly the only way we can know who God is is through his revealing of himself to us which is also what he has done. Uh, Verse 25, you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father, David. Uh, That's a a nod to the fact that this is not some God who uh, made the world and then now floats about it in some ethereal way that we cannot properly, so that we cannot properly know who he is or, or commune with him. No, he's a God who reveals himself to us. You, you often hear people say things, don't you? Like, well, I look at the world and I believe that there must be something out there, some kind of God, but I don't know what or who it is, or I don't believe in a God in, a, you know, in, in any of the, the particular religions that, that we have. But, you know, the Bible speaks to us. The very fact it's of the Bible is that God has spoken to us. He's revealed who he is to us in black and white. This book explains it to us by his Holy Spirit through human authors, gradually revealing more of himself to us so that we can know him and praise him and give thanks to him, pray for him, pray to him and seek him while he may be found. I mean, he's not hiding anything from us. It's all here, the things that he, he wants us to know, that he desires us to know. David was one of those people Old Testament writer of many of the Psalms, one who knew this God and who this God was because God had revealed himself to David. Oh, it's amazing, isn't it? We, we get this book, don't we? This book, this collection of books, should I say. Uh, and part of it, he wrote down what he learned so that future generations like us could learn about the most incredible person, the most incredible being in the entire universe, the very same God. He's not an unknowable God. And what God has said, we see coming about in the world around us. I mean, take how the believers quoted David's words in relation to what Peter and John had just gone through. Verse 25 to 26. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. It's a quote from Psalm 2, verses 1 to 2. Straight out of the Old Testament, straight out of one of the Psalms that David himself wrote. And whether he knew it or not, David spoke about the opposition that the Messiah would face many, many, many years later down the line. The kind that Jesus then did face in his lifetime. And of course, the same that the apostles were now facing themselves, having just spoken of Jesus. Jesus having performed a miracle in their midst of the healing of the lame man. This was all prophesied about. It was all the people from the Old Testament looked ahead, saw this kind of thing happening and wrote about it. And you see, the Bible is not just a random collection of books lumped together for good measure with no dots to join up. It's all joined up. It all makes sense when you put it together in the big picture. A little plug for the Bible course. That will be great in putting together the big picture of the Bible, how we received it, how it came about, why it matters for today. I'd encourage you to join us once again. And it all shows us that our God is God, who has revealed himself to us, tangibly black and white. But of course, as the prayer goes on to highlight, visibly in one man, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, which is the third aspect of what we learn about God, the God who is the Christ. They declare together, verse 27, indeed Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. That's how Psalm 2 has specifically shown itself to be true. But it also tells us something really important about God as well, that he is the unique God and different from any other. You know, sometimes people say things like, oh, well, don't all roads lead to God? Uh, All religions lead to God? I mean, they're basically all worshipping the same God, aren't they? But you know what? Even a cursory, even even a very simple reading of Scripture blows that idea out of the water completely. The uniqueness, or one uniqueness among many, is that the God we worship is Jesus Christ. No other religion will say that they worship Jesus Christ as God. Jesus himself stood and said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And no other, no one, no other religion would even begin to imagine that their God would humble themselves so far as to come into the world and to die on our behalf, on behalf of the the sins of his people, of mere people, 
of just us small people in the grand scheme of things. Yet that's what we see Jesus doing. That's the uniqueness he has. He's unlike any other supposed God. Jesus chose to live with his creation, relate with them, experience our pain and sadness and joys, and finally to die for them so that we can know him forever and eternally through faith. He's unique and he's personal. Uh, Canon J. John, if you ever get to hear Canon J. John, um, uh, he's a brilliant speaker and evangelist. He, he once contrasted this in one of his talks about the uniqueness of Jesus as God and the relationship we can have with him. Uh, he said this, uh, people will often ask why Jesus? There are many other religions, many other philosophies, so why Jesus? There are only four major world religions that are based on personalities. Every other major religion could be termed a philosophy. The four major world religions based on personalities are Judaism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. The father of Judaism, Abraham, died in 1500 BC. The father of Buddhism, Buddha, died of food poisoning. The founder of Islam, Muhammad, died of a fever. The founder of Christianity, Jesus Christ, died by crucifixion. You can go all over the world, but you, can, you will not find one person who will say, Father Abraham lived and died, but he is alive now and I talk to him. You can go all over the world, but you'll not find one Buddhist who will say, Buddha lived and died, but he is alive and I actually communicate with him. You can go all over the world, but you will not find one Muslim who will say to you, Muhammad lived and died, but he is alive now and I communicate with him. But, he said, you can go to every continent and almost every, every single country in the whole world and you will find people who will say to you, Jesus Christ lived and died, but he is alive now and I actually communicate with him. You're walking down a street, he finishes, which branches into two and you don't know which way to go, to the left or to the right. You're really confused, you just don't know which way to go. There are two men lying there, one's dead, one's alive, who are you going to ask for directions? Jesus is the one who personally relates to us, the only one who lived, died and rose on our behalf. And that's where we see prayer really taking its shape, the asking of Jesus, our personal Saviour and Lord, to move and work, to relate and love, to challenge and change us, to empower and encourage us for the task that he gave to us. That's what prayer is all about. He's exactly the saviour that believers know and that we can know too. I mean, think about that for a second. It really does change the nature of prayer, doesn't it? How much a privilege it is to relate to God in prayer. Because through Jesus, we can have this relationship, a personal relationship restored with the living God of the universe. Who doesn't, and this is a God who doesn't just say that he cares about us, he doesn't just mention it along the way, but he proved it to us by the sending of his Son on our behalf. That's the privilege of the God that we follow, and it's the privilege in prayer that we have to commune with him. He's the God of all creation, the God who has revealed himself to us, and the God who is the Christ our Saviour, and that's why we can praise him in prayer together. Second heading then, we see the purpose of God in prayer. Okay, so we understand who God is, whom it is we're relating with, which bring, brings about its own awe and wonder at the privilege of prayer. What about the purpose we see in prayer as well though? Well, first thing is, is most importantly, we see that the purpose of God always triumphs. That's really important as we think about the purpose of prayer. Verse 27, 28 of the passage, I'll, I'll reread it. Indeed, they pray, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. That, that was what the people did. Their desire and actions. They crucified Jesus. They, they stood against him. But listen to what these believers then say about those plans. They pray, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. You know, there are some people who say things like, wasn't it a bit careless that Jesus lost his life? You know, <laughs> wasn't he a bit careless that he ended up on, on the cross? If Jesus was God, well, wasn't that just something a bit strange and odd that he would allow himself to do? 
Surely he could have done it differently. In fact, it was the accusation, it was the taunt of the religious authorities, wasn't it, at the time, at his crucifixion, as he hung there on the cross, that they shouted at him, if you're truly God, bring yourself down. Why don't you do that? Save yourself, they said to him. They couldn't believe what Jesus was doing if he was claiming to be God. But little did they know, little did they know, that what was happening right in front of them was exactly what God had planned. It's exactly what he would put in place since before the dawn of time. Jesus, born as God, and Jesus to die as God for the sins of humanity. Even where wicked people thought that they had won, even if you know Satan was laughing as Jesus hung on the cross, dying before us, what we actually see is none of that. We see a plan that God had put in place since before the dawn of time, triumphing over every principality and power. It's a reminder to us that even when all hope seems lost, as it might have done to the people of the day, as it might have been for Jesus' disciples when they saw him hanging on the cross, even when it might appear lost, we're reassured that God's plan stands. God's plan never fails. That's reassuring for our lives, in fact, isn't it? Even when all seems lost, even on the darkest of days that we go through, even where our world or, or wickedness or sickness or sin seems to have the last laugh, in Jesus we're reminded it's never the end of the story. I mean, think of the motivation that that brings us to pray. That not only with Jesus, anything we go through is never the end of the story, but that Jesus himself is one day going to finish that story as well. Nothing that happens falls outside of his jurisdiction, outside of his power to change, and that will be true until the end of time itself. Uh, right at the beginning of his gospel, the, the writer of, uh, of Acts, uh, Luke, what was it he recorded that the angel told Mary after he said she would give birth to the Son of God, that her elderly relative who was barren would conceive and give birth to? He said, for no word from God will ever fail. The purpose of God always triumphs. All we have to do is look at Jesus to see that's true. You know, through the times we're living through right now, through the, the difficulties, the isolation, perhaps the monotony that we feel about our current circumstances, the disappointments, the loneliness, the, the sickness, and even the sadness of death. No word from God will ever fail. All who believe in him are safe in his dwelling, for he sent Jesus and he knows the beginning from the end. Prayer reminds us it's not about us for starters, but it reminds us that we're not alone that Jesus' plan will stand the test of time. He's God, we're not. And we should trust him through prayer that no matter what, we can bring our requests to him through prayer. And it's through this same God we can bring our requests to him. The people of God are to continue in the power of God. Verse 29, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. It reminds us that prayer finally, that the people of... Finally, prayer reminds us, should I say, that the people of God are to continue serving him in the power of God. And that gets us to our last heading uh, this week. The power of God through prayer. After they prayed, we read, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. The shaking that they, they experienced was God's confirmation. It's as if he was saying, yes, what you've prayed is good. It's great. It's wonderful and right. That he would then powerfully enable their lives too, following on because his power was at work among them. And at the very same time, he fills them with the Holy Spirit once more, brimming them up and over so that they would continue to preach the gospel boldly and without fear, despite the threats that they had been faced with. Interesting, isn't it, though, that their prayer wasn't protect me from harm or take away this difficulty. Their prayer was use us in spite of the threats, enable us to be a people of light and hope and, uh, and of the gospel. Seeing lives transformed, changed, just as the Lord has transformed and changed us. 
so that Jesus might be honoured and the people of, God, people of God encouraged to serve him well. It's the power of God that we see through prayer because we should never, ever underestimate what God can do. And that goes whether it's in us or through us when we pray. Our world could be a very changed place. And so where does it leave us? Well, I hope it leaves us, first of all, encouraged to pray, reminded who we're praying to, praising the one who gives life to the world and the one who has shown himself to us when we don't deserve it, we cannot earn it. It is such a privilege to pray and to do so as first priority than as a last resort. Second, and I hope an encouragement for us to pray big prayers as well, because we have a big God whose power and will will always come about, no matter what, and we can trust him. That is the basis of our relationship with him, trust. And after all, it's not at our level of faith that means prayers will come about, though we have, to, we have a measure of faith in praying, of course. But it's a measure of faith which entrusts the outcome to God, because he is the God of the universe, sovereign over all things. It means we can pray big prayers in his name, knowing he will hear us, and if it is his will, respond in power and grace in our world, our community, our church, and in our personal lives and families too. Let's be a church that is not afraid to pray big prayers, trusting. And finally, it's an encouragement for us to pray that God will fill us once more with his spirit to fulfill his will and purpose in and through us, whatever the future holds and wherever he may take us next. You know, perhaps you could spend some time later today in prayer with God, praying for the future, bringing your request to him, thanking him for all he's done, praising his name, and also lifting to him some big prayers that we would love to see happen, that men and women would come to faith in him through the gospel, that he would change hearts to trust him, that he would make people look to him as the author and creator of the universe, and that we ourselves as a church can be a witness to that. So let's pray right now as we come towards the end of our time together to pray a similar sort of prayer, a similar sort of prayer to what we've read this morning, and give our requests to the Lord. Let's pray together now. Sovereign Lord, we, we praise you that you are indeed the Lord over all creation. You're the God who gives us purpose. You're the God who made all things, the heavens, the earth and everything in them. And in that we find great hope for our lives because you grant to in the world around us. We thank you too that you've given us your word which speaks to us, which displays who you are to us in our hearts and minds. We, we thank you, Lord God, that this word is black and white, that it is the means by which we see you more clearly, understand your ways, be brought closer in communion to you. In opposition, you had a purpose in sending Jesus to this world, that you gave him on the cross because he was to be our sacrifice, to enable us to be forgiven from every sin, from every wrongdoing, that we could commune with the living God once more. We thank you that it was by your power and will that you chose to do so, upsetting the author, raising Jesus from the dead so that we might know new life ourselves. And Lord, in spite of all that we see around us, in spite of our world, in spite of the, the, the challenges there are to faith, the challenges there are just to being believers in you, we pray that you would stretch out your hand in power to use us boldly to share your word, to share the gospel, to see lives changed and transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit as we too are filled by that same Spirit. May you, Spirit, work in us. Fill us once again with your presence, your hope and your joy, that we may look out, not just on our own lives, but at the lives of others with hope, because you are the one who transforms lives, and we trust you to do it once again with those around us. Help us, we pray, at this time in particular as well, that you would bless us as a church family. We pray for any who do feel isolated, that we can be reminded of prayer, of the ability to pick up the phone and talk with other people. We thank you, Lord God, that you are with us wherever we go, that your plan and purpose stands for our lives, even at this time. And so may we, Lord, trust in you as the creator of the world. We bless you, we praise you, we give you thanks this morning. Bless us, we pray, with your presence. In your name. Amen.
Amen. Well, we have one more song to join in with this morning. And it's, a, and it's a song which gets us thinking about the times where things are going well and the th- times where things are not going so well. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. Let's share in this song now. God bless you this coming week. Remember to sign up if you want to join us for the Bible course next weekend. And I hope and pray that we can spend that time in prayer and be blessed by God as we do so. Let's sing this song now as we close. Blessed be the name.